yeah, quick introductions here. So my background was actually running growth for different um, startups, both full time and as a consultant for quite a few years, uh, and then began um, building out teams for these companies as well. Uh, about seven, eight years ago, with the whole idea that people experience, uh, you know, doing these roles on a functional level, you know, we'd be a great fit to recruit than, you know, folks who haven't been able to, to, to be as deep in the weeds. Um, so split a time between consulting and recruiting for quite a few years and actually um, just went all in on the recruiting uh, about four years ago. And now we're in an executive recruiting firm um, focused on client, um, generally recruiting across growth, marketing, product, analytics, design, uh, and now we're a team of nine. And Sam, you're going to... Absolutely. Yeah. yeah, it's glad to be here. Uh, thank you for inviting me. Uh, my name is Sam Nasirian. I'm the founder of CozyMail. And we are essentially a marketplace where you can find and book uh, all sorts of experiences around food and alcohol, from in-person cooking classes to online cooking classes to food tours, private chef services, and team building events and around food and alcohol mixology classes, etc. cetera. And um, in the past uh, nearly 13 years, I've been focusing on marketplaces. Uh, I was in uh, leading leadership roles at two previous companies prior to starting CozyMail, um, where I was um, leading a department and both were marketplaces. I was the head of the international team at Just Answer. And then later on was the head of the IT vertical at Upwork. And uh, I have been, you know, since the beginning of my career, very excited about marketplaces, especially marketplaces around um, service providers, because I believe these marketplaces really empower the service providers to offer their services to a larger audience. As at the same time, the marketplaces also enable the customers to easily find and book the service providers, be it at a company like Just Answer, Upwork, or at Cozy Meal. And so it was a very natural step for me to, um, to start Cozy Meal, especially since I'm also very uh, passionate about food and cooking. And so we have been in business now for uh, the past uh, six years and um, are in over 60 cities, or actually more, 80 cities nationwide, as well as in Canada, and are continuing to expand. Awesome. And you say that you, uh, you know, you have a deep love for cooking. Are there any anecdotes that you can speak of before you started Cozy Meal that kind of speak to that? Were you, you know, were you recooking regularly? Is there a certain type of cuisine that you, you've just fallen in love with and that's your favorite? Would love to like kind of dive deeper into that and, and your love of food. Absolutely. Yeah, I mean, I, since I was a child, I always liked, uh, I was always very curious about cooking. I would watch my mom in the kitchen cook, I would often sit next to her when she was watching cooking shows and really enjoyed um, um, buying uh, groceries, uh, buying high quality produce and cooking. Uh, and it has been always a part of my life. And then when I came to California, uh, I moved from Germany to the US in 2007 for grad school. And I went to Stanford for grad school. And when I moved to California, and uh, I got even more excited about cooking, especially because California is such a melting pot with so many different cultures and different cuisines. I think the cuisine that I'm mostly passionate about is actually Californian cuisine because you have really high quality produce and it has some also obviously some influence um, from other ethnicities, especially Asian cuisine. Uh, and, and I love the high quality produce. I love the Um, the dishes that are tasty as well as healthy. Uh, the number one thing that is important to me are the ingredients. So I usually um, I prepare often simple dishes with very high quality ingredients. And to this day, I regularly book also cooking classes with Cozy Meal, and not just to test the product, but because I, I like learning about new cuisines and preparing new dishes, and also connecting with other people when I'm taking those classes. Very cool. Yeah. I mean, I, I grew up in California as well. And yeah, it's pretty hard to find the level of ingredients that we get in California um, being as fresh and, and consistent anywhere else in the world. So uh, I, I definitely understand that. Um, so yeah, just a quick overview about this program. We try to bring in people who um, have built great cultures and have consistently had to hire great talent. And, um, you know, 
get feedback and insights on, on how they've done it. Um, and we call the series uh, World's Best Boss. Good. Glad to be here. Yeah, we're, we're so excited to have you. Um, especially because, you know, everyone is such a foodie these days, right? And there aren't, there aren't that many tech products that are really integrating that passion that everyone has. Um, with, with what you've built. So I, I think it's really a fun area for, for, for an audience to learn more about. Um, also, particularly how to like fuse your own personal passion into your own startup as well, right? You see a lot of startups chasing trends and like going after whatever's popular at the moment when the founders, frankly, could care less about, uh, you know, uh, that particular industry or that particular product or that particular customer just because it's popular and trendy. But it's great to see someone who's sort of taken their passion and then also turned it into the product that you get to play with and build. Uh, you know, on a, on a daily basis. Um, and then with that, you've, you've built a kind of nationwide team, both within localized headquarters, and then also kind of the model of having people being uh, geographically distributed into targeted cities that you want to, you want to grow over time. And uh, I'm curious, you know, what, what, what are you looking for when you hire someone? Um, what are the key traits? What is like your sort of litmus test on whether you find someone who's going to be phenomenal for you or not? I'd love to know how you, how you go about it. So there's some standard criteria that I think a lot of people follow. I would say probably everyone follows. You know, you look at the resume, you know, you want to check, you know, their education, their relevant work experience. And those are obviously very, very important. Um, I also look at have they been jumping around a lot in their previous careers or not. For us, it's very important when we hire people that they stay with us for a long time. Uh, I think that gives them the opportunity to have a big impact in the company. And it's also good for us um, because obviously over time, and they also build up a knowledge base uh, that they can leverage in their role um, and they build up really institutional knowledge. So um, it's important to me that usually in their career, they haven't been jumping around too much. Um, culture fit is very important to us and also that I can see myself and other team members as well, they can see themselves working with that individual candidate. And the way we usually find out about it is that we, in the interview process, we, we do some case studies with them. And those case studies are not only just puzzles that sometimes companies you know, ask you to solve, which I think they're, they're not bad, the puzzles are great. But usually also we have like real world questions, like for instance, we are working currently on, on launching several new product lines and um, we are already in the middle of, um, of the launch for those product lines. And so um, one of the questions is usually, how would you launch this product line? Can you walk me through the steps? And usually um, those questions are often, often challenging. Um, sometimes, depending on the question, we give them maybe a few days to prepare and then maybe set up a second meeting where they present it. Sometimes also they, they would answer it on the spot. And they don't only help us better assess if they can think analytically, if they can solve the problem, but they also help us assess to a certain extent if there could be a good culture fit in the way they are interacting with the interviewer. Um, if they you know, find a challenge during the problem solving process, um, how are they dealing with it? If we give them feedback, are they you know, reacting to it or not? Are they reacting to it in the right way or not? Um, and then we are really passionate about food. You know, every single team member at Quizma really loves the product um, and also loves the space they're in. And so for us, it's an added bonus when they're also obviously passionate about food. And I think because of the fact that we have a product that people usually like, I mean, who doesn't? And it makes it easier for us to, to find people who also really like the product and the space. Yeah, I'd imagine. I imagine you get a ton of applications because, again, everyone everyone's so excited about being a foodie these days. Um, thanks for running. Thanks for running through that with me. And do you feel like you look for for different traits or o almost a different profile for people who are, um, you know, within your HQ versus people who are located and as 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 kind of city managers and in all these different locations? That's a good question. I mean, some of the traits are the same, no matter what the role is, you know, uh, you know, we need them to be reliable. Um, I, um, everyone in the role, in the, the company has some form of ownership. So 
I would need to feel confident that this person can own this project and handle it. And, and so those traits are the same, no matter if it's someone, you know, um, focusing on one city or if it's someone who's actually managing multiple cities. Um, obviously, you know, um, with some roles that are more, you need more generalists. So then for those, you obviously need some different tra uh, traits than if it's someone who's just a specialist in one field. And I think especially some of the cases, and, and this is also how we put together the case studies for the candidates. So if it's someone who's a generalist, we usually you know have case studies where a good generalist would be able to uh, um, do well versus if it's a very specialized role, and then the case studies would be also catered towards that. Okay, that, that makes a lot of sense. And and tell us about the kind of thought process of having people located within different cities versus having everyone in one HQ. Um, and what what role do they play for you? You know, like what? Because I think that's a model where we've seen companies take two completely divergent paths, right? Where even like uh, you know, I know Lyft versus Uber. You know, Uber was big on the the kind of city GM model where. Lyft tried to kind of centralize it a little bit more. What they, they still hired geographically, but they tried to centralize it a little bit more than Uber. We'd love to learn your thought process on like the, the, the trade-offs that you were seeing and then also like your strategy with that. Yeah, absolutely. So the thing is, is I believe, you know, the more specialized there are about the city and uh, the better they know um, what works in that city, what, what doesn't. And when you look at the experiences uh, in the marketplace on Cozy Meal, um, you know, many of those experiences are in-person experiences. And, and so by knowing the market well, you also know which neighborhoods are uh, popular as it relates to food tours, as it relates to in-person cooking classes. And that really helps us. And uh, that really helps us. Um, and we have been also, we have been following the model of having specialists um, in each city, and that has been successful for us. Um, also, f during the onboarding process of bringing uh, new partners into our platform. Okay, great. And and when people are sort of and, and how many cities do you guys have employees in currently? So we have team members um, in pretty much every city we have business. We have team members, and, um, and the employees are in a subset of those cities. Okay, so, so uh, like, how, how many how many are there currently? And um, so, uh, the, the the total team of Cozy Mail is, is around. Uh, if you count the core team members, it's around uh, twenty five, and then we also have a, a, a set of um, freelancers we work with, photographers, um, who uh, who create a lot of um, visual content for us. Okay, cool. Makes a lot of sense. Um, yeah, so the next question on here is, uh, how do you evoke strengths within teams? Uh, you know, when, when there's certain people who have certain strengths or maybe even don't have certain strengths, how are you as kind of the leader uh, able to sort of bring that, to bring that out of people? Yeah, it's a good question. So for us, um, it's very important to me personally that I empower the team members. And I think it's good for the team member, but it also ultimately it's good for the company. Um, and so when we hire team members, I, I do my best um, and I tell also the hiring managers within the organization that they should do the same to, you know, define clear goals, give the individual also enough responsibilities that that individual owns part of the business. So if it's a junior team member, that junior team member would be owning a smaller part of the business. And as a junior team member, you know, grows within the organization, that ownership will also grow. And then as a result of that, they feel empowered that they know when they do something, first of all, it has a direct impact on the results, but also they know they're moving the needle in that business unit. And this has been working really well for us as an organization to, to, to empower team members and give them the opportunity to have a big impact. At the same time, I think it's also important that they see a purpose in the job. Um, when you look at our marketplace, we have chef partners we have uh, partners who are offering food tours and um, and we are expanding into other uh, we have mixologists and we're expanding into other verticals and one of the goals of our marketplace is also empowering those partners and helping them to 
um, increase their earnings. And so I, I always make sure that the team members at Cosima, the employees at Cosima, see that purpose as well, because that itself also really um, helps to get the best out of the individual when they know there's really a purpose um, in this. It's not just like them meeting their goal, you know, them, you know, making their salary and the bonus, but also, oh, I'm actually helping uh, our partners um, to have a better life and, and have a better income. Amazing. The next one. Um, what are some tips for handling cross-continental kind of remote teams? Um, you've, you've already spoken to how many folks you have in so many different locations. Any tips for, you know, maintaining culture, communication, um, keeping people motivated when you can't, you know, see them in person? Uh, any, any failures also that you've learned that you guys maybe uh, didn't do right and you had to kind of go and learn and go back to the drawing board? Would love any, would love any learnings from you. Absolutely. So, you know, we had this setup early on, you know, I mean, even, even when we, when we started Cozimio and we were just in two cities. So we launched Cozimio with its current service in July, 2014 in San Francisco. Shortly after that, we expanded to LA and then we were for two years only into those two markets. Um, and even then uh, we had our software engineers, which is still the same team um, overseas. Our software engineering team is in Ukraine. And so we had from the beginning on to work with remote teams and certain things that have worked really well for us. And I recommend it to um, um, other entrepreneurs and other executives is you need to treat them the same way as if you're all in the same office and mm -hmm. the communication should be ideally the same way. Meaning that I would not just rely on email communication. I, in our company, we do, we have a lot of meetings. Whenever you would meet, you know, when they were all in the same office, we also do that meeting even with the remote employees. The meetings are always via video. It's very, very important. And I believe when you have a video conversation, it's 70, 80% the same as if you are sitting next to each other. And this way, you actually do to get to, you, you do to get to each other. And you, you see each other several times a week. And uh, so that's something that's working really well for us. Uh, like all the communication besides email is via video. You know, you can use Zoom, you can use Skype uh, and, and other products like Google Hangout. That's very important. We have regular meetings. Um, we have something we call them scrums, mm -hmm. uh, which and it comes obviously from, from engineering slash product development. Um, but we introduced it, I introduced it essentially day one at the company, um, which means we have, um, Three days a week, we have um, our scrums where every team member, pretty much every core team member joins it. And then each team member says in 20, 25 seconds what they've been working on, what they're planning on working on. And um, all the scrum meetings are also via video. So you get to see each other, you know, what the other people have been working on. Uh, it makes the job more exciting, you know, you, you know, you want to present what you have accomplished. You want to hear from others what they have accomplished. It also encourages them to have conversations afterwards. So sometimes someone might mention something interesting that they've been working on, and then um, someone else in the, in the team hears it and actually would like to continue the conversation, and then they connect after the scrum meeting and continue the conversation. So I think the most important thing, if you want to sum it up, is communication. You know, and that you want to you want to keep the communication going, and um, you want to do it ideally over video so you get to see each other. Failures, um, I think we have been lucky that we we introduced this very early on, simply because uh, in my previous roles I was also managing remote teams, and we were already doing it that way. This way, uh, this was easy for me to introduce because I just continued what I had been doing already at Upwork and especially at Just Answer where I also had a remote team in Europe. Um, but we have had, you know, in the past, obviously we have sometimes hired freelancers where I feel there was not enough communication happening. And then the resulting um, project that they were working on to complete was not in the way we expected it to be. And then what we learned on was really have more regular communication. 
And and I think nowadays with all the technology we have, it's it, it's it's really easy, and it really replaces the need to be all in the same office. Yeah. Okay. No, that that makes a lot of sense. And it sounds like a lot of your previous experiences helped make it really smooth as you moved into the kind of this organization because. Yeah, you saw some of the things go right and not so right at, at Upwork and, and, and Just Answer. Um, this is something we were just talking about before we, we started the, the session here. Um, how have you shifted gears during COVID um, across the board and in, in any way? Yeah, good question. I think uh, one of the key benefits we had was uh, we were not all working uh, from the same office, so which meant technologically, Switching to video calls uh, was no challenge at all because we were already doing that. In terms of the product line, we had to make adjustments. Um, you know, Cozy Meal was focused entirely on in-person experiences prior to COVID. And um, we already had the large network of really very top-rated chefs, uh, mixologists, and then the switch we had to do was to switch to online and offer start offering online experiences from online cooking classes to online exology classes to virtual team building events that a lot of companies book with us. And um, it turned out to be much better and easier than I thought in the sense that these online experiences have been very popular um, and our online experiences are all live and interactive, which means if you book a cooking class, um, it's, it's like as if in the same room with the chef, you ask questions, you can ask follow-up questions, the chef checks on you, asks you to show your dish that you've been preparing to provide your tips. And um, I believe actually even uh, when the world has defeated the pandemic, um, these online experiences, the popularity will probably go down compared to the current popularity, but I don't think it will go down to the level it was prior to the pandemic because people also see a big value in them. For instance, um, I'm a huge fan of our online cooking classes. I booked one on Sunday. I attended one on Sunday. I'm attending another one this coming Sunday. And the reason is because these online experiences are often logistically much easier to set up, um, meaning that if you book a, like an in-person cooking class, you have to go to the venue, you do the class, you have to come back. And obviously, there's a social aspect. You have a great time, and people love it, and it's good. Um, and I don't think that will be replaced, but I think another option is, is if you do it from your own kitchen and within an hour and 20 minutes or an hour, you prepare a you know, dish in a life interactive cooking class. You don't have to travel to that venue and come back. And I think that provides um, good benefits. Yeah. Um, so that was certainly one of the big um, shifts we made uh, is towards online experiences. And then uh, on the, in-person experiences, we, we started providing our chef partners with more options to communicate to the customers what um, measures they are taking to make the experiences as safe as possible. So if you go on Cozy.com, uh, we already we are getting now, again, bookings for in-person experiences. And then so you see that it says that in the, in the profile, chef will be wearing a mask. Chef will be providing masks. This experience is social distancing friendly in the sense that the chefs usually spread, spreads out the participants in the room so that they have at least six feet um, a distance or some of the experiences are outdoors, especially if it's like a barbecue class. So we did that. And then there have been some products that we as a company have been planning on launching for a while um, in the past like year and a half. And you're planning on launching them um, in 2021. And those products are more um, immune to uh, COVID-19. And so because of the pandemic, now we decided to launch them sooner. And so we haven't made the announcements yet, but in the next few weeks, uh, we'll be announcing a few launches of product lines that are related to food, alcohol, and cooking in general. And uh, that worked really well during the time of the pandemic, but would also work well outside of the pandemic. So we have, we have been keeping quite busy. Yeah, no, that's amazing. That's amazing that you've been able to shift, make so many shifts. And honestly, I think I'm more, I'm more attracted to your online uh, classes than your probably in-person classes because I love the opportunity to, to get lessons from people who are geographically located all around the world, right? If I want to learn about 
Um, you know, for example, Grace right now is in Argentina. If I want to learn about Argentinian cuisine, I'd much prefer someone in Argentina than in New York City. I'm gonna, I'm gonna, you know, I'm gonna feel like they're gonna be able to bring something special to the table since since they're currently there and they're up to date on all the newest trends over there. So I, I love that the fact that you can basically get a get a chef from anywhere in the world and not just within your, you know, 25 mile radius. Exactly. That that's that's another huge benefit. Um, uh, and if, anywhere in the country and in the world, yeah. So we have like chefs in um, Italy, Spain, Japan that are offering, uh, you know, Italian, Spanish, or Japanese cuisine in your time zone, and then you can book them in your time zone, and it's a life interactive class, and it, it's a great experience that you would otherwise not be able to to have unless you travel there. Yeah, no, that I, I love that. It might be a lot more boring of a date night though if you're if you're both on Zoom instead of uh, you know a local a local cooking class. Um, but yeah, I'm guessing like one of the biggest drivers of in-person is sort of like date nights. Yeah. So in-person date nights, uh, we would do a lot of girls night out, uh, a lot of team building events for companies. Um, for all those, um, use cases though, we also, uh, have the online experiences and, 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 and they use them, use the online experiences. I mean, for date nights, it's usually obviously for couples. So it means when the couple books it, they're usually in the same room. The person who is not in that room is, is, is a chef um, and the other participants, obviously, if it's a public class, not a private class. Um, so that's been working really well. And then companies book it for virtual team building activities. Uh, and that's another thing I think we will have post COVID more remote teams. And as a result of that, if you want to do a team building activity, um, it has to be virtual um, because they are in different locations. And I think these virtual team building activities will also um, stay popular even post COVID and more popular than they were before. I hope so. I mean, I'm sure logistically it's pretty fun for your, your, your chefs to be able to just circle through so many classes at once and have huge audiences and it, it makes a lot of sense. Um, so as, you, as you've sort of grown, obviously there's more and more employees with your org, they're geographically distributed. You know, I think when, when you're a small nucleus and there's you know, five people sitting in the room, together, you guys can all be on the same page, be of the same culture. But, you know, what have you done to implement maintaining, you know, culture and excitement in the company as you have so many employees now? Uh, how has that changed from sort of like that five people sitting in one room to, you know, to the number, to the large number that you're at now? Yeah, it's a good question. And also very distributed team. And um, mm -hmm. I think the things you were um, we were trying to do in terms of culture when we were a much smaller team. It's important to try to try to maintain them even when you're a big team. And you see a lot of successful companies that have hundreds or thousands of employees. They usually try to do the same, which is you want to make sure that everyone is about, aware about the company vision. And ideally, you want to have the buy-in of every single team member. Um, you want to keep the clear communication. You want to make sure that people have uh, no, these are the options that I can communicate with my team members. These are the options that I can communicate with the executive team. If I want to provide uh, feedback. So I'm always, I tell every single team member, you know, whenever they have feedback, even if they don't report to me directly, I'm available to receive that feedback and they can always connect with me. And, um, and then in general, you provide them the opportunity to, uh, to provide feedback and listen to the feedback. And uh, whenever, uh, as long as it's possible, make adjustments that you can make. This has been really key um, uh, to our success. And um, this is also something we want to maintain no matter how big we get. Okay. And um, do you ever feel the push and pull between, you know, obviously your venture backed company and, and so forth? You know, so obviously you have to grow at certain multiples to, to please the investors and just to please yourself as you're running this company and you want it to grow uh, and naturally. Have you, have you felt having to en encounter a trade off between in the name of hyper growth versus company culture? Uh, you know, has it torn the culture apart? Or not torn apart, but you know, created rifts at all and, and, and chasing hyper growth? Uh, you know, do you feel like the two have to be misaligned? No, not at all. I think, uh, I think as long as, as you empower the team members um, and each team member actually owns a business unit um, and you communicate to them clearly, these are the goals. The, you know, we want to get 
from A to B, and this is the reason why I want to get from A to B, you can get them actually very excited to, to also contribute to the growth because they see the benefit themselves. And that then actually helps you uh, ensure happy growth uh, versus if you just said, you know, came and said, you know, our revenues are at 5 million a year. Now we want to increase to 50 million a year in the next 12 months. Do it. Versus, you know, you, you know, you have a clear path and, you know, communicate to them clearly, okay, this unit, you know, we want to grow from here to there and this is how we want to get there. And you as a team member will be leading this part of the initiative. Um, you can actually get the team even more excited than before. Okay. Amazing. Thanks for that. Jump to the next question. Um, you know, I think as you are a CEO of a company and as your founder, you're, you're going to have made mistakes along the way. Otherwise, you know, how are you going to learn? Um, was there any kind of thing you can point to where it's like, oh boy, that, that was a, that was something that didn't go well. And that was something some people might call a failure, but I was able to learn a lot from that. Yes. I mean, we, you know, in the past we had, you know, launched, uh, you know, what we usually do is, you know, we, we started offering um, a marketplace where you can find and book cooking classes with uh, um, local professional chefs. And the vision of Cozy had always been to be the marketplace for everything around food and alcohol. So, which meant, you know, we started with um, cooking classes, then we'd be expanding uh, to other verticals. And so we, we had some verticals that we tested in 2016 and uh, they were not successful. And so we, we, you know, we spent a lot of time and money on launching them and uh, we didn't see the success and, uh, and essentially we had to pull back. Um, I, I mean, it was, you can look at it at that vertical as a failure, but I look at it also as an opportunity that we learned something. We saw what didn't work, what can we improve next time. And um, there is like one of those verticals that we uh, were looking at in 2016. We actually launched it and it was not successful. We, we are actually now going to launch it again in 2020. <laughs> so we, we visited and I think we, we have learned from the mistakes we made in 2016. And I'm confident that it will be successful this time. I love that. Uh, so based upon, you know, how the launch went in 2016, are you able to speak at all on how you're going to change the strategy based off of what you learned in, in 2020? Do you maybe launch things slower, launch things faster, do smaller test markets, you know, like from what you did in 2016, are there very specific takeaways where you can say, oh yeah, I, I would have done this this thing or this thing or this thing a little bit differently um looking back and, and with of course hindsight being 2020 yeah good question i mean the, i think there was a combination of several things that um, led to that certainly um that the product itself the the vertical launching that vertical was a good idea but the way the product was um put together was not optimal and, um, and now we, have, we just know better how we can put it together in a way that it will be more appealing to um, uh, users um, and customers um, nationwide and hopefully later on worldwide. Um, that was one thing. The other thing was we decided to launch in simultaneously in two cities you know, with a goal. Uh, I thought we can test it in two cities. Maybe one city might not be necessary ready for a product like that, the other city would be ready. And as a result of that, I wanted to test it in two cities. This time we would just be focusing all of our efforts in one city um, and, and make sure that it is successful in that city before we expand into other cities. We have been, in general, good at that, that when we launch a product, we would usually test it in a few markets before we would roll it out nationwide. But here in this case, I think it, it would have been better if we had just focused on one market. Mm. Okay. And then just slowly keep, keep, keep rolling and rolling, rolling it out and keep the cost lower, learn more and iterate. Yeah. I mean, I think um, for the first market, you, know, you want to really focus on that market. You want to make sure it's successful in that market. After that, depending on the product and the situation and the resources you have, you could decide either if you want to continue to expand it slowly, which means one market at a time, or what some other successful companies have done is once you're proving it in one market, you can take it and then launch it simultaneously in 
20, 30, 40 markets as long as you have the resources. Mm -hmm. That makes a lot of sense. And um, the, the changes from 2016 to 2020, is it now you know, people are more comfortable doing things online and that makes you more comfortable launching some, some previous products that maybe uh, weren't as successful or are there, are there just changes or shifts in the world that will a bit better? These I think uh, uh, the, the, the product uh, we are considering, and, and sorry, by the way, for being so secretive about the product itself. No, of course, uh, we, of course, uh, I understand. And we'll be um, and announcing it um, soon. Um, it is, uh, from our perspective, right now at least, uh, the way we see the product, um, it, we just didn't put the right product together in 2016, um, but that was independent of... Um, COVID and everything that has been going on in the last few weeks and months. So uh, I believe if we actually four years ago, if we had done what we're planning on doing now, the launch would have been already successful. Okay, awesome. Makes a lot of sense. Uh, jump to the next one. Okay. That will be all of the questions. <laughs> okay. Um, yeah, I really want to thank you for, for joining us today. I think I learned a ton. Like, number one, how to keep talent uh, excited and intact across multiple geographies. It seems like what you've done w w was create a foundation at the very beginning of your company that you were able to take from your previous roles and, and all your learnings there. Uh, usually, founders go through a lot messier of a process and not really that they don't really understand the foundational layers of, of, of how to do this stuff until, you know, years down the road. But it looks like you're your previous corporate experience or startup experience and marketplace has allowed you to kind of come in on day one and, 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 and lay that foundation. So that's really great. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, thanks for joining us, Sam. And this will, this will conclude our uh, live event. Um, if you're interested in the recording, definitely reach out to us um, and we'll be following up with more information. Thanks so much. Thank you. Bye-bye.